Hello everyone and welcome to the show. It's Trevor with you today and we have a returning guest with us for this episode, Stephen D'Angelo. Now for those that have heard the episode that he recorded with Yokai, you know that Stephen inspires business leaders to be successful. He's a consultant and he leads D'Angelo Advisors. He helps businesses improve in the areas of leadership, culture, sales, strategic partnerships, product positioning, many others as well. Um, There's just a few. He's also the author of the Amazon bestseller, A Single Day of Peace. And he's here to unpack more of his wisdom so we can learn a lot more from him. So welcome to the show, Stephen D'Angelo. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I greatly appreciate it. I'm happy to be back. No, you're you're always welcome. Always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe just kick us off. I always ask the guests this just because it's a good way, way for to start um, learning a bit about who Stephen is. If they haven't caught the other episode, um, I would definitely recommend you go and listen to it after this one. Don't miss that one. Mm-hmm. But for now, tell us a little bit about Stephen and your journey that's brought you to where you are now and how you help people. Certainly, certainly. So my industry that I've been in the business world is in the technology business, specifically the software technology business. And I've been in the industry now for 30 years, just just a little over 30 years. And when I say that, it it amazes me that the time has gone by that quickly. But through those 30 years, I'd say probably 20, 22 of those years, I've been working for venture backed companies. So venture capital companies, they invest in companies that are early stage. They have a new idea, a new direction. And as you know, venture capital firms make investments. And when they do that, they tap into people in their network like me. I'm one of several that they have in their network. And they ask us to go in and either advise the executive team, help them be better leaders, help them be better go to market people, consult the company, or sometimes join permanently. So over the years, I've done quite a bit of advisory work for venture capital firms like Insight Venture Partners, Sequoia, NEA, Shasta, Kleiner Perkins, et cetera, some of the major Silicon Valley and New York venture capital firms. And um, doing consulting, I also have joined companies permanently. So I've been asked to join as president of a one publicly traded company. I've been CEO of an early stage company. I've been chief revenue officer slash VP of worldwide sales several times. And typically when I get involved in companies, it really is to help drive their go to market. Uh, They've got a great product. They got a great vision. They're going in in a direction, but they really need to scale their go to market. So that's really what I do. I get engaged that way. I've helped two companies go public through the years and, um, And I helped sell three other companies. So I've been really fortunate. I've worked for some great companies and not all of them succeed. Of course, I just shared, you know, two IPOs, three I sold successfully, but not Mm -hmm. all of them succeed. And through all of that experience, um, as you mentioned earlier, I I wrote a book called A Single Day of Peace. And what I did was I, I, I decided to become an author because of these 30 years of doing what I do. I had this unique vantage point to see what makes great people, what makes up great leaders, what great makes up successful and happy people. And I saw the difference between successful and happy people and successful and not so happy people. And the happy people did things differently. And I documented those things. And it's funny when I say say that often people will say to me, you mean somebody who's successful financially and they have all these assets, they're not happy. And I'll tell you, lots are not happy. So um, the happy people did things very, very differently. I documented those things and I thought, okay, I'm going to put these into a book to help you know, the world and help people who want to be more successful. And uh, hence, A Single Day of Peace was born. So that's kind of my background outside of the business. I'm a sports enthusiast. I'm an exercise enthusiast. I've got two children, a wife of 26 years, and uh, we live in the great state of New Jersey here in the, in, in the States. Well done. No, well done to all of that, particularly being married 26 years. I think. Yeah, that's, that's really right. Exactly. The achievement. But also, yeah. I was listening to that and I'm thinking, okay, so the smart people will utilize the 30 years you've learned things and condensed into a book. They'll get the book, understand what works and start applying it, won't they? Rather than spend 30 years trying to work it out themselves. Yeah, there's the well done. Thank you for Thank writing you. the book. Um, yeah. Thank that's you. Really good. And I, I say that in lots of different ways, but partly because you've been 
you've been CEO, you've been CRO. So you understand the pressures within the company of leading well, looking after people, making profits, navigating all the changes that happen. Then you've also been a consultant. So you've been from outside and you've seen from a fresh perspective things that maybe the leaders that are you know, in the thick of it don't see. Um, so you've got a really good span of experience and time um, working with leaders, which is really good. And for people listening, whatever size business they're at, leadership is crucial, um, even outside of business, within the home, within your own life. Um, right. I'm, I'm very strong on self-leadership and help people that way a lot. And so it, it affects every part of, of life, but particularly for because the audience of business owners, entrepreneurs, um, and you've got a lot of experience in those environments. What would be some of the some of the things you've seen that that doesn't work for successful leaders? So, what some of the pitfalls that people are in, trapped in, don't see? Because we've all got blind spots, haven't we? And it's wow. easy for somebody else to see them, but we don't see them ourselves. Hence the name. But what would be some of those things you've seen? Yeah, that's a very, very, very good question. Um, you know, it's interesting in my book, A Single Day of Peace, I list 50 principles of success. And when I do consulting, I often talk about nine principles of great leadership. So it's the opposite of those nine things. And I'll share a couple of them um, on them with you. And, and the, the things I'll mention right now, I think, cause the most damage. Um, the first one is around a lack of empathy. Um in my business, and I think in other industries as well, because I've consulted outside the technology business, your senior executives tend to be very, very intellectual, very smart, especially if um, they are a founder of a new technology company. So they have this intellectual capability that's extremely unique, and they come up with a new idea. The downside of that is they rely on that intellectual ability to read people and to communicate with people and to persuade people versus empathy. So there's a lack of empathy, you know, putting yourself in the other person's shoes and being able to understand their thoughts and feelings. Those that are highly intellectual, very often, I suggest to them that we've got to try as best as we can not to figure out the solve of the problem too quickly. And let's understand the process a little bit and let's have empathy. So, for example, you know, you can have a sales organization that goes to a CEO and says, we need to get this deal done and do it this way. And that CEO thinks they know better and they make all these decisions, but yet they're not close to the customer and they don't really know what's going on there. So this inability to be empathetic to another organization's kind of scenario, they're using their intellectual ability. They think they can figure everything out. The second one, and this is probably one of the ones uh, that the, creates the most damage, is the lack of transparency. Very often as leaders, we want to talk to our organization and our customers about, and our board members and our investors about all the great stuff we're doing, right? Company's great. We're going here. We're going there. Everything is super. Our products are great. But yet every company has ugliness, right? Every company has challenges that they have to overcome. The strong leaders are really good at being transparent about those things that they're challenged with. They don't try to hide them. The weak leaders, they think again intellectually they can outsmart, say, their employees. And in their company meetings, they think they can spin a story about some of the things that are not going well. But the employees figure it out. You know, They understand when you're spinning them. And what does that do? That reduces loyalty because it reduces trust. The, the, the employees are basically saying, well, he or she doesn't have enough confidence in me to tell me this straight up what's going on. So they're spinning a tail right now. And very naturally, you lose, you lose confidence or you lose trust in the person. Yeah. So my suggestion is it's good to talk about the things that stink, right? It's good to tell your customers, hey, we're doing all these great things for you, but we know. We haven't delivered on this for you and we're going to fix this. And here's my plan for fixing this or your board of directors. You know, we go through, of course, every, every board meeting, you go through all the things you've accomplished, you go through your challenges, but let's be more transparent 
about the challenges. I can't tell you how many board meetings I've sat in where I've been in the operations of the business. So I know exactly how I'll say ugly some things could be. But when you get to that board meeting, the spin some of these CEOs and CFOs make on those things. And I'm sitting there, boy, I know they're spinning this. I bet the board members know as well. And it, it just, you can feel it in the air. Not good. Um, the last, the, the third one I would say that you want to avoid is the lack of alignment around winning. Um, what I mean by that is there are some leaders that are afraid to make winning one of the priorities of the business because we live in a culture today of things like diversity, which is very important. Things like uh, making sure that your employees are well taken care of through lunches and having good private time and um, balance in life. You know, all of these are very, very important things. However, so is winning. Now, when I say winning, we have to define what winning is as a company, as a leader. We have to be very clear. And that's where alignment comes in. Align everybody. This is what winning means. When we have this market share or sold this many of this product or deliver a new product by this day, this is what winning is. Serving our customers better by having a customer success rating of X. This, this is what winning is. And we must, we are required to do everything we can, work hard, work extra to make sure we achieve those things. Um, I will tell you that more and more executives are not being as deliberate about that. And it creates a soft culture. And when you have a soft culture, people take the easy way out. At the end of the day, we as human beings enjoy being challenged, enjoy being supported, enjoy trial and error, enjoy then ultimately winning, accomplishing the objective. And when we go through all of that with a leadership team or with a leader, we really feel good about ourselves and we feel good about working with the leader. So those are some of the things that are the pitfalls that, that, that I would suggest leaders that are listening that they do their best to avoid. Yeah, no, that's good. Man, we could park on those three um, and, and dig a lot into them um, for the rest of the time we've got together. But, one of the things as you were sharing some of that like culture is really important isn't it um you get the culture right uh, it comes from the leader if you get it right everybody performs to their best um, and i like what you said about not being transparent because employees are sat in the meeting thinking we know it's not working you're telling us the good stuff but if i don't enjoy coming to work every day i don't really care that you know, things look good on paper um, mm -hmm. because I'm not, you know, I'm miserable when I get home and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. And it's easy to just, let's look at all the nice, the nice graphs and the things that are going well. But you can have companies that are, if they're only looking at profits, they could be bleeding money and bleeding opportunities in lots of different ways because, yeah, they're still making money, but they're losing customers left, right and centre, which if they kept them, the profits would be even higher. Um, yeah, so I know it all makes sense, definitely what you're saying. What do you think some of the challenges are for leaders to be transparent then? Because is it fear, would you say? Is it that I need to save face? You know, um, I don't want to be vulnerable. I'm supposed to know it all because I'm, I'm leading the company. Um, what do you reckon? Yes. I would say that when you asked that question, fear came to mind. So when then you said, is it fear? I smiled, right? Yeah. Um, I think they're, the, one of the things is they're fearful that maybe they'll lose their employees. If we're talking about being transparent with employees, no different than being transparent with customers or transparent with my board. Um, I'm fear I'm going to lose them. Like they're going to lose confidence in me because I have something um, that is not going well. The other thing is um, they, they think that they, their people can't handle the truth, right? Yeah. Uh, that they're going to maybe go sideways with the truth. Let me tell you a quick story about this one, uh, real life situation. So I was working alongside a technology company in Silicon Valley, and um, they had a very, very poor culture. There was lots of infighting and things of that nature. And candidly, the reason why the, the culture was poor was because the CEO was doing a, a poor job of being transparent, just being level with everyone. They brought in a chief people officer 
who did a phenomenal job, long story short, over several months, made very good headway. Now, it was during COVID. Everybody's working from home. Um, and this particular company decided they're no longer going to have their offices in Sa San Francisco. Everybody's going to work from home. This CEO had a reason why he was going to move to Hawaii. So him and his family went moved to Hawaii, and um, which was fine. So I had asked him, oh, by the way, when are you going to share with the company that you've moved to Hawaii? He goes, well, I, I, I don't think we need to, to kind of talk about that just quite yet. And I was like, well, why don't you want to talk about it? Well, you know, I don't want everybody to think I checked out. Uh, you know, maybe more people will want to go to other islands and maybe we'll lose productivity. And I said, well, time out. You know, we've had a conversation about this. This is one of those things that you need to trust that your team can handle this. And you're going to tr be transparent about while you're working in this exotic location, you, you got control on things. Well, long story short, he chose not to. Don't you think people found out? And when they found out what happened to credibility, mm -hmm. it went sideways. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this CEO was afraid of the outcome. He was, he was afraid that they couldn't A, handle it and B, maybe they would do what he did. And then he was afraid that productivity would go down because somebody will move to, you know, Croatia, somebody will move to, uh, you know, the Caribbean and, you know, but hey, if you're working from home and it's okay for you to go live in a, an exotic place, it's okay for everybody to go in an exotic place. Let's be transparent about it. So I think it's fear. It's that they don't think their team can, um, can handle it. But then there is also one other factor. It's their own self-confidence. It's their own self-esteem. They're not confident enough that they'll be able to deliver the news, which may not be great news, but still be able to keep the team rallied around them. So I think it's a combination of the fear, employees can't handle it, and then the third item, uh, just their own inner confidence. Yeah, the, that makes a lot of sense. So how would you, let's dig into the culture aspect a little bit more as well. Um, partly because I'm curious as well and for people listening they've got teams they've got staff um, either there is family members or they're in different parts of the world wherever maybe Hawaii you know, who knows um, right. but so having a leader that that isn't transparent to the right extent we we mean that to the right extent as well don't we of course it's partly how you communicate what you communicate and why yes. where you do it um, and in lots of ways the trust that you've built up before you get to the point where you want to communicate something that's hey, a little bit scary, a little bit vulnerable, maybe, um, from where you are, um, so that they're all important factors. But other than that element, what else have you seen that contributes to good culture and, and not so good culture? It's more than a box of fruit every day, isn't it, for the staff? Yeah. Um, you've mentioned there's a balance of well-being and, and flexibility and things like that but unpack a little bit more um how can we within whatever size company we run how can we build and be intentional about having a healthy culture yes so my answer is that i believe it starts with definition as to what you want your company to stand for and what it is that you are going to be comfortable and excited about to demonstrate day in, day out. And what are you going to promote day in, day out? If you identify those things, and if you then implement them day in, day out, you are going to naturally create a culture. Some people may not like it and they're going to leave and that's okay because you're not for them and they're not for you and that's healthy. But those that are with you, now, as long as you're demonstrating those, people know where they stand. So when I do this, I often work with companies, whether it's a workshop or I'm doing long-term consulting with them, we talk about just this. And, and I ask them, let's map out, give me some things that are important to the company and being successful. And they'll come up with the typical kinds of things and then I'll start adding things. I'll share with you in, my, in the audience here, the kinds of very specific culture points that I have found that when you incorporate these, you create a great culture. You incorporate, but it's important demonstrating them daily. Um, the first one I mentioned, it's winning. 
So it starts with winning. And if everybody says we are here to win, here's what winning is defined as, and we all must work hard together to do it. You set the example that we're here to win. The second one is we talked about, uh, we didn't talk about this one yet, but important accountability. So am I going to have a culture where everyone's going to be held accountable, which means you are going to be uh, asked to deliver the result. And if you don't deliver the result, we have to find out why. Maybe you weren't well prepared. Maybe something went wrong, or maybe candidly you dogged it. You didn't do a good enough job, right? But you're going to be held accountable. Now, the third one, if I'm going to hold people accountable, the third principle of a great culture would be continuous learning, which is enablement. If I'm going to hold you accountable to get a job done, I also have a responsibility to enable you to train you, to educate you, to help you be the best you can be. And that's a responsibility that I have. And if my culture is delivering on that, it's creating value. The next one, we talked about it, transparency. That ability for me to communicate to the company when things are good and also the brutal facts when things are not so good. Um, the next one is around process data metrics. I find that organizations that have a defined process they manage through data and they measure with very specific metrics. Nobody's surprised. Everybody understands. And when there's no, when everybody understands, everybody's on the same page. The next one I see is being market driven. Uh, mar we all have great visions for what we should be delivering. Like, you know, the iPhone is always the great story. Steve Jobs didn't go ask people what they wanted. And they said they wanted an iPhone, right? He had the vision. But as he launched the iPhone, he certainly got lots of feedback as to what worked or what didn't work. And it was that market feedback that he made it better. So being market driven. The next one is diversity, making sure that we've got different minds, different backgrounds, because it's that diversity that allows you to see things from different angles that helps you as a company be most successful. And then the final two are really a personal connection. One is caring. You know, my people need to know that I really care about them. Yeah. not just because they have a number and I'm holding them accountable or there's a result that they have to achieve, but am I helping them advance their career? Do I care what, what they want? Do I care to know what they want? Can I help them advance their career? They need to know you really care about them. And then the last one is having fun. You know, we have to find time to have fun together as a, as a company, yeah. uh, because let's face it, we work more hours. We're at the office, so to speak, you know, today the office is this, but we're working more hours and we're with our family and more hours in leisure time. We can't make this a drag. We got to make this a little light sometimes, you know, good professional, responsible fun, but you got to have some fun together. Yeah, yeah. So those components I just shared, I, the companies that embrace those and I, and I call it spiritual leadership, actually, that's what I call it. And it has nothing to do with religion or spirituality, but you're creating a positive spirit. You're creating a positive energy by utilizing these specific leadership principles. And the net result, if you demonstrate them day in, day out through good times and good and bad times, you're creating a united culture. Yeah, absolutely. This is good stuff. This is Thank definitely you. good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I like, I like what you said lots there that I could comment on. Um, accountability. I think it works both ways, doesn't it? Accountability. Like if you're leading the company, you can hold and expect your staff to be accountable to you. But like you say, if I'm leading my team and I'm not providing the support they need, the learning, if I'm not giving them access to skills and development, they're not, I'm setting them up to fail. Um, who wants to come and work for a boss that <laughs> isn't supporting them? Exactly. Right, right? Um, exactly that's where you get the high turnover isn't it and high turnover is costly for an organization um in lots of different ways as well as just the financial aspect um so yeah i really like that accountability is important um from both sides of it and just feeling valued as well isn't it it's like if we're going to come and invest our time our energy in lots of ways the most creative part of our day is spent at work isn't it so if we're giving the best of our creativity to an organization that doesn't value us, um, yeah, it's, why would we stay there? Yeah, right. The sort of questions we need to, like you say, empathize and be on the employee's perspective and their side of it and thinking, would I follow me? You know, <laughs> and obviously exactly. I'll answer that without the biased view of, well, I'm great, aren't I? You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Now, to that point, if I just may say this, yeah. that empathy piece does have another side to it. We all understand that senior executives have to make decisions and you're never going to make everybody happy. And, you know, sometimes you can have the listening skills, you can have the empathy and you're being, you're getting information, but now I need to make a decision. And I'm asking my team, support me. This is the direction I'm going. I'm going down path two versus path one. I know a lot of you wanted path one. Some wanted path two. You both had good reasons for both. We're going path two. I need the people that in path one, if they trust me, they're going to say something like, okay, I wouldn't have done it that way, but I'm behind them. I'm behind Steve. I'm going to go with him and I'm going to go do this, right? Yeah. Uh, at, we as senior leaders have that responsibility. We have to call the shots. Yeah. And our people have to understand that that's part of our responsibility. Yeah. And they have to support us as we make those decisions. And I believe if we do the right job and listening to our people, executing those principles I talked about just, just now, these leadership principles, if we do that, now I have to make hard decisions, I'm going to have the people rally around me. They're going to they're gonna help me through these difficult decisions. But if I'm... If I'm not being transparent, I don't show I care, I'm not really holding people accountable, I'm not helping develop their career, and now I'm going in a direction that they don't like, man, that's where it starts falling apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You also mentioned consistency as well when it comes to you know establishing the culture. What does winning look like? Um, but also in how we show up every day, isn't it? But like if one day I'm happy and the next day, or you know, don't talk to him, give him a wide berth, it's like, it just doesn't work, doesn't it? Um, you you become a bottleneck in lots of ways. You create a culture of mistrust. Therefore, when you say something good, people are thinking, "Yeah, but does he really mean that? You know, mm -hmm. is he just saying it?" So yeah, lots of different elements. In some ways, it, there's lots of different bits to think about, but the core of it really comes down to being honest, being willing to learn, valuing people, valuing yourself enough that you admit, "Hey." I'm on a journey, not got it all together in every area. I've got people around me to su support me where I, I'm still learning, where I'm weak, because you might be in a leadership position, but it doesn't mean you're perfect at everything. You need a support team around you. Um, but also just you're improving and you're looking to build the lives of your employees, your team, as well as making money. In some ways, making money should be a byproduct. Yes, it's crucial. It's important to stay in business. But if you focus on the culture, they'll back you up through navigating those tough times that you mentioned. Um, and I like as well what you said about diversity. It's like it's being confident enough as a leader that you have people around you that won't just say, yes, boss, great idea. Mm. Even when deep down they're thinking, no, I, you know, that's never going to work. You need people that will, in a, the right way, respectfully disagree offer their opinion but then as you say at the end of the day the buck stops at you and i'll follow you where you're going you know or right. if i really have a conviction that i can't follow you that's when my chapter with you finishes and we go our separate ways um, and again if that's done in a good way you don't burn bridges you value people you appreciate the experience but you realize that hey not everyone works with everyone for a long time do they sometimes there are short periods that's right um and then you move on it's just we're on different journeys we don't always end up on the same journey for a very long time um obviously it's good when you find a team that you can continually invest in you continually grow together and you can be you know longevity is a, a good factor from Absolutely. a marriage perspective as you as you know you can definitely uh, comment from that um but yeah there are I suppose it's settling and, and realizing that whether people are around for a long time or not, I need to value them for who they are, for what they can contribute as well. Um, and when I feel that maybe it's not the right time to continue, you value them in them moving forward. You don't try and hinder them moving forward. You help them navigate to where they need to go to next with the potential that, hey, in the future, it's a small world. Paths may cross again. You might work and they often do yes and they often do yeah yeah, yeah. no yeah, i like that yeah. there's so much in this episode um I, i'm certainly going to listen to it again after this just because i'm still learning as a leader in lots of different ways um and i 
I hope I always do. I never want to finish. That's learning. the mark of a great leader. That's always learning. We don't we don't have it figured out. We're never at that, you know, perfection point. We're always striving to get better. So that that's a mark of a great leader. Yeah. No, that's good. And it's it's having good people around you as well, isn't it? Having the mentors, the consultants, the coaches, whatever it is you need at that point in your journey, it's having people around that support what you do. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's really good. I knew we could talk for hours and time would go really fast. Um, just in the last minute or so, we need to wrap it up just for now. Uh, but by all means, you can come back a third time, you know. You're almost part of the family, Steve. I'd be happy to. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you. I'd be. I'd love to come back again. Right, right. The, but there's lots of insights that you've got from your experience um, that we can all learn from as business owners and as individuals, like positioning strategic partnerships. Just a couple that I'd love to dig into another point. Um, but anything else, just while we're in the leadership flavour and we're focusing on mm -hmm. this, for people that are listening, as I say, large companies, small companies, the principles are the same and how you scale them up depends on the size of your company, doesn't it? Anything else that you you want to share just in our time together we haven't covered? I, I think the only last point I would make is I shared those principles that I help companies with. I call it spiritual leadership. It's just creating a good positive spirit on all those points I made. Hmm. I think at the end of the day, great leaders should never feel like they shouldn't be um, – goes to accountability, they shouldn't be tough sometimes. I mean, you know, our job is to make sure that we get things executed. And sometimes you have to be tough, much like a sports coach sometimes has to be tough on their players to get the most out of them. But when you do it in a caring way, even, you know, even when you're being, you're challenging an employee, which is okay, if you're doing it in a caring way and you have that culture as the foundation, it's going to be well received. And it's important that the team knows that here is a person that cares. Yes, they like to have fun. Yes, they're transparent. But you know what? They're here to win, and they're going to hold me accountable. And if I don't deliver or if I dog it, they're going to come and talk to me about it. No free lunches. So my last point is it's okay to be tough sometimes when you have to be tough. We don't have. We should not avoid that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what fosters the right sort of respect, isn't it? It does. Um, yeah. As you said, with all of it, there's a balance to it. You know, if we take a principle and we run off too far in one direction, it doesn't work as it should. But no, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Lots of wisdom there. So thank you for everything you shared. So you, you've mentioned that you've put a, most of this in the book, if not all of it, and a lot more, um, yes. which is really good. So for everybody listening, if you want to grab the book, definitely get hold of that where's the best place for people to to touch base and to find out more about you i guess the book being an amazon bestseller it's on amazon but yes you've got a site that they can go to as well what absolutely yes they can visit my website a single day of peace.com the website is primarily you know it, it talks about the book it does cover the spiritual leadership principles that i talked about a little earlier so they're all there in graphic form so a single day of peace.com uh, there you could also contact me. My, my email is a single day of peace at gmail.com. So real easy to reach out for me there. And uh, of course I'm on LinkedIn, Steven D'Angelo. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can go there and reach out for me through LinkedIn, but the email is probably the best. I review all the emails that come in. So if anybody wants to talk about leadership or needs some help around leadership, I'm happy to be there. I'm happy to help. Um, so again, yes. And of course, Amazon, if you go to Amazon, a single day of peace, you can order the book. It's also on audible. If you rather listen to books, I listen to most of my books these days versus reading. Uh, so if others want to listen to the books, it's there on audible as well. Yeah, no, that's good. Do you listen to most of them? Cause you can put them on a faster speed. Or... <laughs> um, actually sometimes yes, but more so that it's when I'm in the gym or when I'm driving, that's when I listen to books more like, you know, yeah, I'll listen to music sometimes when I'm in the gym, but more often than not, I'm listening to a podcast like yours, or I'm listening to a book. Yeah. I'm listening to some motivational speech that's on YouTube that I'm really enjoying. Um, it's in that, you know, normally downtime where it's got that empty space. Yeah. yeah sometimes I want to check out and listen to good music when I'm working out or driving as well, but that's more of when, uh, when, when, what, why I like to listen to books. It's just, hard to find reading time between emails and everything you do all day long. It's hard to get that quiet time, but that's very important to do to get that quiet time. Yeah. 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 And another area that 
again, we couldn't go into today, but mindset, you're very strong, specific, disciplined about mindset and how important I am. It is. Very much in the book. That's very, very much in the book about the right mindset uh, to really be connected within yourself to achieve the success you are looking to achieve. Yeah, no, absolutely. Key, all key stuff. So thank you again for everything you shared. Um, it is my yeah, pleasure. My so pleasure. Much. Thank you for having me. No, it's brilliant. Yeah, so much that people can dip into and just for the moment, for everyone listening, don't get overwhelmed by all the things that Stephen shared. Just pick one or two things to start with that's resonated more than the others. Um, whether they've kind of prodded you, made you slightly feel uncomfortable, or it's challenging in a good way. Just take one or two things and think, how can I adopt that? How can I start to implement that? And then, yeah, grab a hold of the book, chat to Stephen. Somehow support your learning in developing and growing in that area. Once you've got that up and running and kind of you're in the process of developing that, then go back and pick up one or two other points together they'll all work together so the more you develop and grow in those the more holistic and a successful way your culture will be your company your marriage your relationships however you apply it um, it has benefit in all areas so yeah lots of good things i was going to say lots of homework we don't like using the word homework lots of good opportunities to research and to learn um, exactly things forward. So, yeah brilliant from that so thanks again Stephen. really appreciate your time with us today. my pleasure pleasure to be here thank you for having me now you're welcome and for everybody listening yes we will catch you on the next episode